we're back. Another week, another podcast. Welcome to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I'm your host, John Dayton. With me tonight, I have a decidedly reduced panel. Uh, a couple of the, our regular members, Carl Macy, I couldn't make it. Had some fatherly duties to attend to this holiday weekend. And uh, Gordon Wood is, uh, his title's really long. It has a lot to do with automation and computers, but he's an HVAC guy. So somebody's air conditioner air conditioner's brain is broken and a lot of people in a hospital somewhere are too warm so he's off taking care of that and uh it's actually the holiday weekend now but by the time this makes it to air it'll be a week after memorial day so whatever we're uh we're usually always a few days if not a week or more ahead here but we try to keep the lag to a minimum so at any rate joining me this week to my left is anthony kuzabucky who is fast becoming one of our regular panel members hello and to my right is my good friend Matt Dacey, who was my roommate for a couple of years back in college. And we're actually going to talk about education a little bit later on, so we'll see if we can dredge up some funny stories. Uh, but Matt is currently working as a rep for? The Lansky Group in New York. There you go. So he sells the good stuff. How you doing? <laughs> you can, we can uh, read your business card off or uh, put up a link later on because we're not shy about plugging stuff. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we had gotten into just a little bit, the new Behringer digital desk, the X32 that's coming out uh, last podcast. I mean, I'd, I hate to sound like I'm terribly excited about a, a Behringer product, but I've always maintained that uh, they make some good stuff and some junk, but you know they're providing gear at a price point, and they've said themselves that their motto is twice the features, half the price, and reliability, whatever. <laughs> yeah, and, until they get caught for stealing someone else's product and well, that's something interesting I found out, though, is that they've never lost a patent suit. They've reverse-engineered other people's stuff. I and say, I don't think they've never actually like, made anything of their own. Well, that's what they do. They look around, they, they see what uh, what people want, and then figure out how to throw a couple extra knobs and buttons on there and chop the price in half. The knobs and buttons don't do anything. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the awesome knob on yeah. But if you look at if you take the big picture, I mean, guys that mix on Midas's probably don't want Behringer stuff. Although, looking around the circle, uh, I don't know about, well, Carl doesn't really own a rig, but I'm positive that he is at one time or another spec some Behringer gear to go in on some client or another's oh, yeah. project when budget was a concern. Uh, I've still got a couple Behringer pieces in my rig, and to be honest, I, like to get the next best box, I would have had to spend an extra thousand bucks, which for a $300 box is, that was working out all right for what I was doing. You got, you got something, I know you do. I've got a four-channel compressor that we use for... Uh, auxiliary instruments that we don't use every week <laughs> exactly that's that's what the stuff is for when you're when you're dirt broke and getting into it it's that it's four channels more of compression than you would have had and you're only out 150 bucks i mm -hmm. mean and of course the guys that buy 1200 dollars a channel clark technic and and all that stuff it's are now owned by behringer anyways <laughs> so now you can get a model of it but you know, it's I don't know. The, the argument that I always make is it's apples and oranges, so you, it's not always a direct comparison. But it is kind of cool, kind of exciting. Um, I've been wanting to get into it because I kind of want to like have a little thrust and parry with with Gordon and or uh, Kevin or Kevin. <laughs> we could call Kevin. <laughs> we could um, with Carl or, or Gordon about it because we always go back and forth about stuff like this. But um, not everybody has had a chance to review. All of the propaganda, I I kind of feel like Behringer might have overstepped it a little bit. They didn't call out Prozonis by name, but apart from holding up a banner and doing the Neener Neener dance, they were really going for it <laughs> in the in the Behringer produced YouTube material. Um, but apart from that, uh, there are a couple of interesting pieces out there on YouTube where uh, distributors got a few minutes alone with the desk at the NAM booth, and the features look cool. It's uh, it's hard to tell from a five minute walkthrough if the stuff really. You know, if when the rubber meets the road, they are really solid features, but at first glance, it looks cool. And if it's bringing motorized faders and DCAs and digital snakes into the sub $4,000 digital mixer range, I, for one, am going to be looking pretty seriously at it because to throw something at a bar gig, I, you know, my, my little Allen, my baby Allen and Heath and my rack of analog gear is worth more than that. <laughs> so if it's a matter of some drunk redneck spilling a beer on it, it's easier for me to cover one piece of digital gear with my, my skinny body than to cover a, a mixer <laughs> and 14 spaces of rack equipment. Um, so anyway, we're going to let that lie. Uh, there is one example that I know of at the moment where there's uh, a guy who's actually had one out in the wild. There's a, an engineer in Germany who got to take one out, um, did something outdoors with it on a, I think it was an L Acoustics Cara array system. Uh, gave it pretty good reviews. So, uh, but he was on the on the uh, forums that I saw him, and he had to be a little cryptic about things, and he wasn't really able to speak out until uh, the article that he had written for 
a website or a pro audio mag actually went to air. So I'm kind of watching that stuff to see when you know the the real questions start flying behind the scenes, uh, what his answers are to stuff. But his initial reports seem to be that for what it is, it's a pretty solid box. You know, like I don't think anybody's gonna gonna ditch their Soundcraft SI or VI or their Midas Pro Two to to go out and get one of these, but. What basically amounts to a disposable piece of gear. It's looking kind of cool. But anyway, I, we're think, I think later on there's uh, there's something that just got released. I don't know if released or, or demoed. Um, but one of my friends went actually left a conference early to go and see it. Um, Yamaha is creating a new lower line of digital desks as well, but they have Neve preamps in it. I wonder what a Neve preamp sounds like when it has absolutely no headroom. <laughs> Gets into the nice compression. Sound, sounds center. awesome up until minus twelve. Yeah, and then it's just well. Then does it get into like that nice Neve board compression, or does it break up like the rest of the Yamaha stuff? I don't know. Honestly, I probably have a lot, lot more biting commentary about <laughs> Yamaha stuff than I do about anything Behringer ever made. Because Behringer, I expect to be garbage, and I'm surprised when it turns out to be nice. When I walk up to a sofa-sized Yamaha at a festival stage or and find church. every channel crackling at negative twelve, I'm a little disappointed in that. Anyway, okay, that got a bit of silent laughter on this end. <laughs> if anybody who's been in that situation knows what I'm talking about. Um, so anyway, with uh, with our slightly reduced panel, I couldn't even convince Carl to to Skype in, so it's it's just us chickens here tonight. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring up, we were actually talking about this in the parking lot a few minutes ago, was education. And uh, we always go back to this because really the most frequently asked question we get by people that come up to us is, how do you get into this? They're either curious to know our story or they, they kind of want to know what the roadmap is because they want to go into some sort of line of work in production, be it stage, studio, rock, theater, recording. Or they or they want to know what not to do so they don't end up in this line of work. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> as hard as it is what to What did you do? I want to do exactly the opposite and, and be able to sleep well, at night. Start at, by studying a respectable trade at a, <laughs> at a proof college instead of going to some bougie art school. <laughs> So anyway, I, I'm just going to have us kind of roll through what our uh, process of education was because, I mean, it's such a – we keep coming back to this topic because it's really such a big one. Um, you could ask 5,000 people what their path – their career path was and you, I have no doubt, would get 5,000 completely different answers. No two are going to be exactly alike because it's not like you just, you know, you take your EP classes and then you get your history major and then you become a history teacher. There's, there's, no, there's just too many ways to go. And in fact, the one piece of advice that I give a lot, it, it, having been through, you know, I went and paid for an education in this stuff. Um, if it turns out that you've got some talent and you're motivated, you should probably just go try and get a job somewhere because that's four years lead time that you can get over your, your classmates' competition. You could have somebody paying you, probably not much, but somebody could be paying you to, to learn your craft in the field. And, uh, you know, if you absolutely need a piece of sheepskin that says you did something on it, go to the local community college and take a few business classes so that you don't bankrupt yourself like most of the sound guys I know. There's a few out there that are just really shrewd businessmen, but they don't mix very good shows. So. <laughs> hey, let me ask you something. Sure. Is, besides Full sale, is there any, like, really dedicated production school out there that's going to get you going with like live audio and stuff like that? Oh, it depends a little bit on what you want to go for. There's a place out in Phoenix um, that's sort of more aimed at recording guys. And then a lot of state schools, actually within, uh, I can only really speak for New York, but um, SUNY Potsdam is reputed to have a pretty good uh, recording program. SUNY Geneseo has a pretty good like media. Fredonia does too. Fredonia, right? yep. Gatestone, yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, Fredonia was the one I'm thinking of. And even like some little community colleges have some really pretty respectable theater programs, recording programs. They kind of roll it all into one, so like you don't come out ready to you know walk up to the Hit Factory and submit your resume. But um, but are these all dedicated, or is it kind of like? A sub major within something else. No, you, you, just can, kinda... you can you can get a, a music production degree, which is what I wound up getting where we went. But um, yeah, and people are like, uh, I'm trying to think of examples. It, it, they can be found out there. The thing is, you know, great, you got your sheepskin. That and four bucks will get you a cup of coffee down at the corner. Right, it's practice that's going to make it happen. It is, and it depends on where you go. And actually, perfect example. Um, the third podcast that we did was on touring. Um, the two guys I had in remotely were both on tour at the time. One of them had, he really should buy lottery tickets because he, uh, he went to a private school, went through a recording program, uh, liked it and was motivated, went to Full Sail, graduated, got headhunted by Claire Brothers and went straight on tour with Journey. And he's been out with uh, Journey, the Eagles, John Mayer, and is now out with Van Halen. 
So, like, that's the gilded, like, silver platter with the engraved invitation kind of career path that right. never is going to happen to anybody right. realistically anywhere. <laughs> Um, everybody else, I mean, whether you go to school or not, it's, you gotta claw your way up. And, and my, to my thinking, I mean, that, you know, the thought in the industry is that if you went to full sale, you're a schnook. And, but I, having said that, I do know a couple of guys who are really good techs and have a really diverse set of skills, um, and, and just are worthwhile. Like they have great attitudes, they're great technicians, they're great designers, have good eyes and ears. And my thinking has been, it doesn't matter if they went to full sale or Harvard, they were motivated. They were going to learn what they needed to know. They were going to make connections and work angles and get into stuff. So, well, I mean, that's the thing from when we went to school. It's the mafia that you went to school with that was keeping you going. It was. And I maybe, think that's the thing that we gained the most from. Yeah, you know and I mean? that was actually that was the very next thing I was going to get to. Matt and I both went to SUNY Purchase. For those of you who don't live in New York State, uh, it's S-U-N-Y, stands for State University of New York. And instead of having one big state college like Pennsylvania does or some other states, our state college is a system of schools that are spread out across the state. Um, we went to one that was just a little bit north of New York City and had really, really intense ties to Broadway theater. So we... Uh, I started out as a theatrical lighting design major. Matt actually went all the way through the program. I transferred to the other end of the campus after my junior year to where they had they were just starting up in their music department a pretty good music uh, production degree. You couldn't take all that fabulous, huh? <laughs> there are a lot of fabulous people in the theater. <laughs> um, but the the thing that was killer about our department, like it, uh, well, for one, it was trial by fire. Uh, you know, they would say to you on the first day, "Look to your left, look to your right." Those people won't be there when you graduate, or if you graduate, or you might be one of those people that leaves. Um, they perfect you by trying to kill you. The workload is incredibly intense. The professors you're working for are are or have been working on Broadway. A lot of those offices had Tony Awards sitting on the shelves. Um, a lot of Famous, famous Broadway shows that you've heard of were the design, the the implementation of those shows was you know designed and conceived by the, the cats that taught us drafting, technical direction, stage management, lighting design, costume design, and it's all the way down in that art school too. I mean, there's crazy actors that came from there, and it's not mm -hmm. movie stars that came from there. It's people that can really act. Yes, uh, <laughs> big big difference. You know, musicians that came out of there are playing tours, are playing pits, dancers that are playing that yeah. are out there, or choreographers yeah. now. I mean, and what was cool was the whole campus was like that. And actually, you could get a liberal arts education on that campus because, like, they had a math department and an English department and whatever, whatever. Because you know, you had to, had have to a learn something. Education. There was actually, I, I talked to a girl once who was going there, and she was a biology major. I was like, really? At an art school? <laughs> she was like, eh, it was in the neighborhood. But uh, oh, I can't, I'm not going to be able to think of her name now, but a couple of the cats that came out of the music department, a couple of the girls actually got really famous. Um, shoot, one of them, um, uh, her name's not going to come to me now, and it's probably better, but I was, she was a freshman when I was in my second senior year, and I was trying like heck to get her to go out with me, <laughs> and it was... It became clear after she released her second or third internationally acclaimed album that she was cut from a different cloth than yours truly. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, that was the kind of depth. Like real, this, this school was a very affordable state school, but they attracted some serious, serious talent and have for 40 years now. Like they, the school opened in the early 70s. Still do. Um, and it was because of these connections. The all the profs and all the departments were working like down and dirty in the big time in New York City. So, not only the connections you made with the professors and with the people who had already graduated, like the Purchase Mafia is no joke. And it's it's there's nothing sinister to it. But you know, if you're a lighting rep like Matt, you're walking around New York City, you're bumping into dancers who are now working for repertory companies who need lights and and they would much rather buy from a Purchase grad than from anybody else. In fact, people who graduated not just from our department, from anywhere, any department on that campus will go out of their way to work with somebody else that went to school in the Brickyard. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that... Shared sympathy. Shared sympathy. The, the campus was just <laughs> wretched. It, it was kind of, think Soviet. Everything, including the flatware, was made out of brick, and there was nothing <laughs> to break it up. It was just, it was like going to school in a gulag. So you, you had to forge those <laughs> personal friendships just for sanity. Um... So anyway, and all the school, all the departments were like that. They they perfected you by trying to kill you, by trying to get you to give up and leave. And the kids that made it were no joke. They're heavy hitters in the industry today, and they're going out of their way to you know take 
new graduates under their wing and, and raise them up. And uh, it's not for everybody. Like not everybody graduates and wants to go into you know big time theater in New York, and not everybody who graduates even works in their major. Like our our buddy who was like really a golden child in our department. Um, I'm talking about like uh, Mike O'Connor. He worked as a stage carpenter for years and was just doing a little bit of you know dance lighting here and there and and. Um, I mean, it really took, what, like most of a decade before he really hit his stride. But yeah, I mean, now he's like lead designer at American Academy of Dramatic Arts. He does a ton of dance right yep. now. I mean, he's got it going on. So it's, uh, because it is, I mean, as good as purchase grads are, it's still a cutthroat industry and there's a lot of other people trying to claw their way up there. So that's something to think about. If you're looking at a, a prestigious degree, what you really need to do is visit the campus, find out how the network is. And it's... I don't know. I guess that's maybe in students' mind today. Now that you got Facebook and you got LinkedIn, and, and kids are do kind of have a mind, you know, it's in their in their thought process to think about. All right, how am I going to get a job after this? Who am I going to know? Who how am I going to pursue things? But in our day, there wasn't any of that stuff. It was it was literally who you know, who you had met in the flesh, and who you had impressed, and you know, big wigs would big shots would come back to campus and literally ask professors like, all right, hey, who's the shot? Who's the hot shot junior? I need an assistant this summer at Williamsburg. Or, you know, I just got my first Broadway show. Who's who's good? Who do you got? I just pulled one of those two weeks ago, actually. Nice. See, yeah. I'm, I'm sad that I live so far away, but New York wasn't my scene. I'm, I'm happy where I yeah. live. We need a we need a controls bitch, actually, for uh, one of our guys. And uh, we're going straight to the junior class and trying to pick out every lighting kid we can. And, you know, they'll start working for a major controls company, you know, next week. Because that's just how it works out, you know? Nice. So I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of rambling about our department, um, and I, don't know, I really can't say enough good about it. Like, I, I had a few gripes about it, but I, it turned out I was just really sitting in the wrong seat of the bus. Uh, it, was, it was sort of frustrating for me because I got it enough to do it, but I was looking at my classmates who could do it, like, breathing, like, just come up with these killer designs, heart-wrenchingly good lighting designs when you actually saw them implemented in the theater, and, and just were smooth about every facet of their work like to to have them step away from a drafting table and you look at their plates and it would just make your heart ache for how gorgeously these these documents <laughs> turned out and I kind of realized that I was hacking it and that I wasn't going to be able to function at that level and didn't want to professionally but I was starting to mix audio and um anyway to make a long story short I think it's pretty important to look at especially with the expense of education and the sta the condition of the student loans industry in the states a lot of people really maybe shouldn't go to college right away. Like, if you think you want to do this, you might want to try finding an internship or bug somebody and ride along, at least ride along on some gigs. Like, go hang out where you think you want to work before you commit four years of your life and a hundred grand or more. Anthony's nodding vigorously. <laughs> exactly. See how many beers you can have thrown at you before you really, really commit to it. You got to know that you have to love the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Because you can get a nine to five job anywhere. This is a completely different ball game. And the money's not any better. The the rewards are in usually worse. Yeah, <laughs> but we <laughs> we get high on what we do. There's nothing sweeter to me than standing behind a console at an outdoor festival in the summer and smelling the new mown grass and the sweaty hippies and the and the the burning power supply of your Allen and Heath. <laughs> <laughs> it's sweet nectar. <laughs> um, and you know not. <laughs> it's kind of a rare breed, and not just this one example, but you know, to want to go work a, a twenty-hour day just to get to that moment where the band's rocking, the crowd's happy, the sun's going down, and it's all happening. Um, you know, some people, a lot of people, could see how that would be exciting, but not a lot of people would want to live on a bus and put in twenty-hour days to to get there. Then after that twenty-hour day, you still have to load out and get back on the bus and get back on the bus, <laughs> and some poor schmuck's got to drive another eight hours. <laughs> and that's if you're on a good tour. If you're, in, if you're not on a good tour, the hours are the same, the pay's way, way worse, and you're, and you're in a to van. Texas <laughs> from New York to play for three people. And... So yeah, like, the, you know, before you even decide to pick out a, a university, um, it's going to be hard to convince your parents of this, if you're a young kid listening to this, but show them that you're taking your career seriously, and you don't want to throw away your or their or Uncle Sam's money uh, take that and throw it away on an education that you're not going to use. Because I watched a lot of my contemporaries do that. My wife, for example, got a $150,000 private school music education degree because, well, she didn't know what she wanted to do when she was a senior in high school. And so the guidance counselor said, oh, well, you're good at music. You'll be a music teacher. We're going to need more teachers in a few years because they're all going to retire in New York. And so she pursued it, graduated, 
worked in every facet of you know every age level and every type of you know private school, Catholic school, public school, rich public school, and hated it all and got out of it. And I'm still paying for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and, should be pretty close to the end of that, right? Yep. So you know, take your education really seriously because it's a it could could be a real financial liability against you, especially if you have to start over after you have a degree to get a degree in what you really want to do. Um, so. If, you, if you're going to do it, I would suggest, you know, if you're not sure, take a year off. Convince your parents. Get a job type job somewhere, flipping burgers or whatever. Make a little money. Get a car. Get it paid off. Save up some to get an apartment. And take a good, hard look at what you want to do. Find some people who are in that industry. Bug them. Make friends with them. Get inside and see if it's a view that you like. If you're relying on your parents, you kind of have to show them actually what you're doing. Yep. There's a lot of parents that don't even know what any of this is. True. Mine, it doesn't even make sense to them. Mine still don't. <laughs> but they had, you know, they had seen me start to put together this little DJ business. You know, I actually took money out of my college fund to buy my first set of gear, and I really had to persuade him and show him that, you know, no, I was I was going to do this, and I was excited about it, and I was I was going to build it into an income, you know, some revenue stream, and um, they are not they are creative people, but not this way. Um, I'll go too deep into it, but they just—they didn't understand the type of creativity that I've been born with because they didn't either of them have it. It's non-physical creativity, right? Now, my dad's a, a carpenter and a, a gifted, gifted builder of homes, and my mother was a French teacher, so they just—they had those creative centers in their brain and were really gifted in those areas, but did not understand a kid who More got left brain creative. Though. Yeah, who got audio, but I was able to convince them that I was serious about it, and fortunately got herded into a really good program, and uh, and things worked out all right for me, even though it was a little rocky in the middle. I wound up having to pay for an extra year of school to do it, um, which leads me, actually, I want to kind of turn things over to Anthony a little bit. We were talking about it in the parking lot that uh, he's done relatively well for himself having not gone to school and actually I've known him for a few years since actually he was like right in the middle of the the period of time when he was deciding what to do why don't you tell us what you did what you told us before about getting accepted to schools and such I uh I I wasn't I was interested in getting into in sound and lighting and stuff but uh I got accepted to an Ivy League school to go for um econ or well economics and international business I got accepted I got a, a decent, about 50% 50, uh, 50 scholarship to an Ivy League school, and I wasn't sure if that's really what I wanted to do with my life, because right about then, I, the economy started crapping out, and uh, wealth management probably wasn't going to be around for too long, so <laughs> so I figured after after a, a, you know five years of an MBA, or if I went back for a full master's or a doctorate in economics, I'd be close to 200 grand in the hole, and I don't like people enough to teach. Um, <laughs> I could do it for a while. I think being being a doctor of economics, I I could deal with that. Uh, but I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, so I asked my parents, I was "Like, is it all right? Like, I, I don't want to just start dumping money into something. Not even at a community college level. I just don't want to dump money into something that I'm not sure I want to do." So I took a couple of years off. I went on the road and played for a while, and kind of through playing, met John and Carl, and uh, got a little bit more into back into mixing like I, I had mixed it in my church for a while and um helped out some friends at bars and stuff but it wasn't really i was i was more into actually playing gigs and after a while uh musicians are dicks <laughs> <laughs> and i can't there's only so much of so much of an artist that i can take in a day and not need to go home and 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 drink a fifth but um there, there's a lot more creativity I feel I can have behind a soundboard or a lighting console or mostly in a recording studio, having some input in something that I actually like and care about. There's a lot of stuff that I record that's awful. Um, but if it's money coming in, you're still getting to do what you like. Like I haven't, I've spent time on the road mixing and now I have a job full time as an audio and lighting director at the church that I grew up at, which is five minutes away from my house, which I'm at for something like 70 hours a week and I get paid for 40 but I actually like what I do and I don't have $200,000 worth of college debt looming over my head um, my wife's college is all paid off we we don't really have I just paid my car off this month actually so uh, other than buying lots of dumb stuff at Best Buy uh, <laughs> we don't really have a whole lot of stuff to pay off and we don't make tons of money like I think my dad makes close to double what we both make uh, in a year at just one of his jobs, but we like what we're doing. That must give not. you some liberty, though. 
I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, we don't. Yeah, how old to, guy are you? I'm 23. Yeah. Oh, so <laughs> like I've got I've got some. Time. And the mid 30 year olds here are just like, <laughs> uh, uh, world on a string, <laughs> sitting on a rainbow. Kidding me. And I still got John. John keeps telling me I can still pull the Wonderkin card for a while, but I, I <laughs> until feel you're like, 30 at least. <laughs> feel I feel like so you're old enough to grow a real mustache. It's a good <laughs> run right there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I turn 24 in a couple of months. But, I, I, yeah, I still pay more for car insurance than everybody else. <laughs> like, I guess that's my, my real downfall now is that I can't get cheap car insurance and they won't let me start buying life insurance. Um, but, yeah, I've kind of I've managed to, to keep myself alive long enough to, to get to where I want to be. And I still don't have any, any debt or anything like that, which is, which is great. Yeah. And if you had gone another route, like even if you had figured out that this is what you wanted to do and kind of also pursued it during college, you'd I be still sitting have- – Two hundred thousand dollars, yeah. and and not to mention all the guys at a Ivy League school be like, you do what now for a living? I'm gonna go and and, and snort some mahogany. I don't know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, deal with those kind of those kind of jackwads from school. Being like, hmm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go and buy something expensive and destroy it, and you can you can go and eat your ramen noodle soup. And then you're stuck mixing bar mitzvahs on the weekend, and that's awesome. about it. You know, I mean, with this they you're able to do. Jews know how doing. to party. Sure do. You ever been to an Irish baptism, though? Who doggy? They baptize you in Jameson. <laughs> just about. Well, it's just about any event we all have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a wake, a baptism, you know, just have to, Arbor Day. I'm not, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm Polish and I'm not really a huge vodka fan, so. <laughs> but, yeah, to think about that, if, you know, if Anthony had gone off to, you actually got accepted to an Ivy League school. Um, and if he had pursued that and then figured out that this is what he wanted to do and had actually come home and, and worked his way into the same job, Ramen might it might have been the ritzy dinner that, option. If, 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 there was a, if there was a dinner option, if he still owed Brown <laughs> two hundred stacks, so do consider it carefully. Uh, if your parents are giving you a hard time, have them call me because uh, really sort it out. It's so stupid, and the student loan industry just eats people for lunch. It's just miserable. So be sure about what you want to do. There are plenty of ways to find out about something other than taking classes, um, and it's so easy to locate. Like. Guys that do our kind of jobs, we hang out in the booth. We're out of sight. We're completely out of the view of the audience. And so if somebody wants to know what we're up to, They've most of us, us. – st- yeah, 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 it doesn't take too much to prime the pump. I mean, yeah. <laughs> we don't really have a whole lot of people to talk to. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's really not hard to find somebody to take you under their wing and, and show you around and, and see if it's what you're into. Um, I've actually got a kid that's interning me with the- – interning with me this summer um, for some recording stuff, and he's going to Baldwin Wallace for violin performance. He just my wife went. Really? That's money, dude. He's from Orchard Park. <laughs> uh, uh. But, yeah, he, he wanted to... He's not going to get into recording or anything like that, but he wants to know how stuff works so he can at least have a feel when he is playing for... He's got perfect pitch, too. He's just mm-hmm. one of those those bastards. Um, and that's actually cool because that's, that's going to be our topic next week. Um, still working on lining it up, but uh, made contact with a girl we went to school with a purchase. I uh, was in the same department as her. We were in the music department. Um, killer engineer at the time. She was probably the best mixer on campus. Also a crack musician, songwriter, arranger, great singer. Um, she's down in New York doing the singer-songwriter thing, got a couple albums out. And so last time... Uh, Actually, a couple times back now, we talked about um, musicality and how it affects your mixing. And when I get her on an interview, we're going to actually go the other direction. How does your engineering skill affect your musicality when you're sitting down as a musician? Because I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know how many musicians read the blog or sit through an hour of audio nerd speak. But uh, maybe <laughs> maybe it'll be interesting to somebody to to know a little bit about the tech and stuff and find out how a, a successful musician slash engineer is uh, using that information. Um, what else were we? Well, it's certainly a special flavor of nerd, that's for sure. Yeah, it's pretty, I'm actually surprised that we get as much attention as we do on this blog. Like, I literally started writing it for two people, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm really surprised to see hits coming in from all over the nation and all over the world. Which, uh, there are nerds like Brian Moore, Brian, Brian's... Jedi-level nerd. Jedi, Jedi, literal Jedi-level nerd. Um, but, yeah, it's, he's, he's... I don't know if he listens, though, he's so busy working... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's got time free when he's trying to go to sleep. Yeah. And, and that's he, I think he mixes in his sleep upright at the desk. 
Well, I kept my mouth closed for the first 10 minutes of this thing. I was just like, uh. <laughs> I'm talking about some of this, you know, you're not talking about McAdams ellipses and hybrid magnetic transformers and stuff like that. Yeah, as smart That's as the stuff I we're think myself about. when the lighting geeks get into it, man, I studied that junk for far, three years anyway. And like, well, I didn't get a lot of the science, though. We really didn't at the lower levels. We got a lot of the mechanics of things. But, but the, the science has changed dramatically in both. That's so true. Like, but yeah, the color science, especially once you get into the LED realms, is mind-blowing. And it's only getting better. So, like, you know, what was that movie, The Graduate, where there's that line in, like, <laughs> plastics, kid, one word, or whatever it is. You know, that one word, kids, LEDs. It's where the future is. Trust me. Um, I, have, I have no lighting experience. I just kind of... The guy that was in charge of it at the church uh, hadn't changed about 25 bulbs in two years. So they're just like, well, you, you seem to get stuff done around here. So here, have this too. Say, that's a significant outage when you only have 26 lights in your arsenal. <laughs> Big, giant scoop, 700 watts. The whole, that was the whole thing. And you put a green filter on what? <laughs> to help the video guy out, right? He is the video guy. <laughs> White balance this. <laughs> I turned on all the reds and magentas to help You're, you out. We're not doing wicked in here. Could you please put that away? The whole whole stage, blue on one side, green on the other. The whole thing looks like a damn Disney movie. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Put on your 3D glasses. Uh, but actually, something you said, <laughs> Anthony, when you were talking about you know working, even on stuff that you don't enjoy or that's not good, you're at least doing what you love. And I remember having that epiphany when I was, I don't know, about a sophomore or a junior in college, that like, oh, crap. <laughs> I'm probably not going to graduate and get hired by Metallica. In fact, if I'm lucky, I'll get hired by the Spice Girls. <laughs> and, you know. Except your roommate got hired by Alice in Chains, so figure that one that, out. Yeah, things are working out pretty well for that guy. <laughs> Maybe I can get him on here. He's a, he's a lampy, though. He's a lighting guy. But, uh, so yeah, it just goes to show you, like, I moved back upstate because that was the highest thing on my list. I really wanted to raise a family in the town I grew up in, and I would I was willing to put my career on the back burner and just figure out a way to have it in that venue. Everybody else that I graduate is pretty much a big shot in New York now, <laughs> or worldwide. Uh, our one buddy, we uh, roommate, my, I lived with him for two years after I lived with Matt. Uh, he's Alice in Chains lighting director, and when he's not doing that, he's what, Neil Young and Macy Gray? And, and then he has to fill in for Britney Spears and want to cut himself. Yeah, he, he got stuck on the Britney Spears tour, <laughs> but that was 18 months of hell. He doesn't really need to work for he the He hasn't next five. worked since December. And doesn't, <laughs> need, and doesn't need to until about 10 o'clock 2015 if he doesn't want to. So he's, he's really, that was worth doing. His family's doing all right. Um, but that's, that's where, uh, I don't know, I like to... I try not to get a big head, but I'm, I feel like I'm kind of cut from the same cloth as some of these guys. So I've been able to make a value of myself to the people I have worked for because I was flogged to death by those same professors and taught that same work ethic and, you know, go out with the same ethos as these cats that are playing on a world stage. So keep that in mind, too, that um, touring sucks. <laughs> Everybody seems uh, to think it's the pinnacle, but really all the guys on tour are wishing they had a nice cushy regular job at a, at a club or a venue or drugs. except marty drugs except marty he but he's but he's an odd duck he's dutch is the thing he's <laughs> half dutch and you know what they, they, and the other half the psychopath. they ruled the world at one point like between when the romans and the english had it the dutch had the lockdown they like their boats yeah <laughs> so that's and he's those are his people <laughs> but um so anyway enough about education i think you all we babbled on about the process. I think you get it at this point. If you don't, call me. I'll sort you out. Um, something I've been wanting to bring up. Carl brought up last podcast or two ago. I forget when it was now. But um, There's enough of them now that I can't keep track of them all in my head. i got to keep a list handy. Um, Asked us the question, though, at the last... Actually, no. It's the one that's going to go up this week. And there was an act, yeah, Whatever. So the, memorial, the one that posted Memorial Day weekend but that we did a week before... What day is it? Philadelphia. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Moving on, um, he asked the question, what's, what band would you most like to mix or record or work with or whatever? And that led to some interesting answers. Um, everybody's answer got like an ooh from everybody else around the table. And uh, so I wanted to go back in time, jump in with, jump in with me to the Wayback Machine, if you will. Um, I want to try, and I was hoping to do this with all the guys, so we might have to hit, this might become one of the stock questions that we do for interviews. Um, when was the moment, or what was the song, or... What was it that made you realize, like, what was that, that little proto moment when you decided you wanted to get into the field, whatever whatever the field was? And I can go first if you guys need to mull it over. Anthony's nodding. I'm mm -hmm. cool. Like, go ahead, Matt. Take it away. Yeah. Muppet Show. Yeah, buddy. Really? 
you grow up, you're two or three years old, you're watching The Muppet Show. Muppet Show leads to a theater addiction. Yeah, all that behind-the-scenes stuff on yeah. that show. Thank you, Jim Henson. Because, you know, your guy on that show is Kermit. You know, he'll come out, he'll say some stuff, but he's really, he's, you know, screw Scooter. He's just moving around. <laughs> he was just a gopher, yeah. Ker- Kermit's making things happen. Yep. And so you see that, you see everything moving, you know, I mean, and it's electric from then. And then, you know, growing up, big wrestling kid, you know, so it was always the about... The pageantry, the fire. Big spectacle right there, you know, and then moved on. And we were talking about getting your parents, like, involved, knowing what you actually do. Uh, 92, we saw uh, Tommy on Broadway. Mm-hmm. And I said, that. <laughs> and that was it. And then they, they were on board. They got it. Nice. You know, because this is one of the first times they're actually shooting lights out into the house, making the whole thing a pinball machine. And wow. and it's over, you know? I mean, and they, I think that's really the jumping off point was the Muppet Show. And then so it's been a crazy ride from them to entertainment and then architecture and then halfway around the world and back over here. And uh, so, yeah, that's that's where it all began from. And there's so many facets of the industry. I mean, you don't even know when you're first looking into things. I mean, really, yeah, my idea of, of production was The Muppet Show when I was a kid, too. So. And it's damn close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the amount of hair and fur and <laughs> involved. Like, real theater people are always almost, a diva involved, you know? What absolutely. I mean? They nailed it. They totally nailed that behind the scenes vibe. But that vibe was so electrifying. There's a lot more cursing and a lot more. I don't know. Were there any gay Muppets when we watched them? Probably not. There are a lot more fabulous people in real theater than there were in The Muppet Show. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, it was, yeah, like, I, I since you mentioned that, I'm not going to bogart that. But, yeah, I mean, The Muppet Show was totally magic for me. But growing up in a small town where I was, there there literally was no production. But my church used to once a year hire in, like, a, a gospel quartet. So, like, and you can actually look these guys up. Some of these quartets have been in business since the 50s. And had lineup changes and whatever. So, like, the Kingsmen came and, and sang in our little fire hall, and the Gold City Quartet came around. You can look these guys up on YouTube. They're still out there, still in business. The village people came. Hush had, now. <laughs> That's a lineup Methodists changes. don't even know who the village people are. Are you kidding me? But, um, yeah, like, these guys no, would come with, like, a six... literally brought in a fireman and a mailman. And, <laughs> and John was the carpenter. And... <laughs> I got I'm sorry, a text message just came in. I got to give a shout out to my intern who just successfully built his first jewel thief. Uh, I don't know if he was on Instructables or whatever, but he's been really getting into component level building and figuring and troubleshooting and stuff. So good on you, Evan. Can't wait to hear about it tomorrow. Um, but they, that, as bizarre as that was, seeing these guys play, like there was 500 people in the room and they were riveted on what these guys were doing on stage, but the room was too big for four guys to just sing into it. And so there was a PA there and granted it was like a, an early eighties era Yamaha six channel mixer amp that had probably a total of a hundred Watts in it, but there were some pole speakers and there were some wedges there. And there was a guy there like playing with microphone stands and stuff. So that was my first exposure to actual production, small as it was. And, uh, it's weird. The thing that finally got me, I forget if it was, I don't know if it was a beer commercial or what, but there was, there was this commercial on when I was pretty early in high school, and they were just interviewing a roadie. You know, what's it like on the road? Oh, it's hell. You know, it's this guy <laughs> with a big white guy afro and a big push broom mustache. But, you know, they show him swinging from the truss and throwing cables around and moving a semi. And I'm just like, yeah, I want to be that guy. And it was right around the same time that I was discovering metal. And at the time, like, every metal video was either, you know, concert footage or they would set up a concert stage in a hangar. And, you know, use extra smoke and extra lasers. So, like, you know, I was, if you didn't have a thousand feet of trust in your video, you weren't crap. <laughs> so that was what I was getting on the, on my music side of things. And then I got to see a, through this this one stupid beer commercial or whatever. It might have been even when, like, tobacco, like, when you could still advertise for Skoll or something. I think it might have been a dip commercial. <laughs> but whatever it was, like, that was, like, my first true glimpse into what backstage was like on, on big stuff. <laughs> you can't advertise for roadies and use cocaine on TV. <laughs> right. Uh, I think I think my my moment was the place will be crawling with union guys in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I, it wasn't that long ago. Like I I always dabbled in, in sound and stuff and it was more, oh hey, you know how to make stuff work and, and make it not sound bad. You should do this. Um and, and I was okay with that, but 
I think more of the production aspect, I was sitting in my friend Joe's bedroom in his, uh, his mom's house, helping, or while well, I was playing bass on a record that he was, he was producing and engineering and doing pretty much everything on because everyone else is incapable. Uh, but he, uh, it was, it's really incredible to see somebody that knows what they're doing take complete control of a situation and, and mold it into something cohesive and something that matters and something that makes sense. You take um, a bunch of guys sitting around writing lyrics and chords and you slosh it all together, but there's one guy at the end of the day that knows how to bring it all together and make a hit song out of it um, and, and make something useful out of garbage, essentially. <laughs> like, there's a lot of crap that, that went into uh, into recording a lot of that stuff, but it I don't know what it is, but he's Joe has got a fantastic ear for recording and production, which is what I've tried to get into more of now. Like, I do a lot of engineering and recording in the studio, but where, where I find that I really actually like is in the songwriting process now. Like, I like being involved when a song's coming together, when a band is really getting their grasp on something. Um, and I think that's that's what made me actually want to pursue getting into this full-time and, and doing this as a profession um, instead of just keeping in the back of my brain. Something that I could, you know, actually at the end of the day, instead of showing somebody a bunch of numbers on paper and like, hey, you made 0.02% on your IRA here, you made an album. Like, there's something yeah. tangible about it that makes you feel good about what you did. There's also, I mean, if you're going to ever link sound and light some way, they're both those beautiful, intangible arts that only a few people really, really get and appreciate. And I think we tend to cross-appreciate each other. Oh, yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's sort of a similar head. We both enjoy being the glue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we don't, you know, you don't need to be the paper and you don't need to be, you know, whatever sticks to paper with glue. <laughs> the glitter? Whatever. Glitter. Fine. Yeah. We're not glitter. No one needs to be the Cer sparkles. Certainly we're not glitter. <laughs> we're a little too dirty for glitter. <laughs> but where the, the popsicle sticks. <laughs> we can appreciate uh those middle pieces. And uh there's actually something a bit spiritual about it too. Oh, if, absolutely. If you, Even want, if you don't work in a church, yes, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to get to, you know, some sort of a semi-religious thing about it. I mean, in those gaps is where you find, like, spirit. Mm -hmm. It's pretty amazing, you know, and you'll find that with, you'll find that with both sound and light. And, and what's great about it is it's actually also a faith-based industry, meaning somebody has to trust you to do something and they don't see anything. They see a lot of stuff there, but there is no, you know, samples, there's no wood, there's no tile there's no nothing like that and it, it doesn't capture well like i can't give anybody a decent idea of what a show that i mix sounds like no. even the best recording doesn't put you in the room and you can't video light you can't the technology's not there yet to get good pictures like you can get an idea of what we do but you can never capture it, it and even if the technology got good enough there's still an atmospheric thing that you could never get mm -hmm. with both of them you know i mean that is genius man yeah. Totally. That's why you brought me here. That's one of my favorite <laughs> things too. Now that you mention it, of that's why I like theater so much and rock so much. Because even nowadays, everything's recorded and, and you know for posterity or for profit or whatever. But just the fact that, like when I was starting out, I would love the fact they'd be doing an outdoor show in the summer and the band would be playing, and I would sometimes just turn around at the mix and just kind of watch the sound drift off over the hills and into the sunset. Like there, that happened. It's never going to happen like this again. It's just floating off into the night like this, and, and that's, that was just magic. But, but there's real spiritual mm -hmm. stuff behind that. It's, it's like, amazing. Especially like at the end, an end of a production. Like after you've put in all the time and all the effort into whether it be a, a full week-long show or month-long show or however long. Even if it's a day, there's something about once you – like closing time is playing in my head right now. Right. Um, there's a but, breath. Yeah, there. there's just at the end of – don't like, hum it or off. I play, pay synchronization. Yeah, on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no royalties uh, for that one. <laughs> please don't sue us. Um, no, but the, like at the at the end of it's in everybody else's head now too. Sorry, <laughs> you're we'll suck on that for the next ten minutes. Um, <laughs> we'll throw a YouTube link up for that. Uh, there's something at at the end of that production. Like I don't know. I still enjoy 
like at the end of that stupid festival <laughs> that we did, oh. that it was it was a it was six a.m. load in, and then we were there until two in the morning because they had a dance party after, and my band actually played in between, so we had load in, mix all day for whatever however many long hours. They didn't feed us like they were supposed to. I think I ate a blooming onion <laughs> all day and had one beer and. Uh, had to play and literally almost passed out from exhaustion on the stage. Like I was wobbling pretty close to the edge and then had to stick it out another like six hours until I, we were done. Cause they wouldn't let us load yeah, out because we couldn't load out because there were 200 moronic drunk people just dance humping away for, for hours. And, but after all that was done when the last piece of gear got rolled down the street because they wouldn't let us pull the trailer up. <laughs> so after we rolled, you know, a 25 foot trailer, you know, rolled all that stuff, like a quarter of a mile or half a mile, shut the door and just leaned up against the trailer. And I grabbed a cigarette because it, it just, there's something about like cool night air, everything's done. Like you accomplished something that you can't put on paper. You can say, okay, I did this, but it's, it's not going to measure up to actually being there and having something that that you feel inside of you, that you feel accomplished, that you feel like you did something that you really believe in. Um, and that's, that's one of those things that it's an intangible representation of mm -hmm. what you do. You can't, you know, it's not going to turn out the same way. To divert a little bit too, yeah. I think that's one of the best talents you can learn really in any, any industry, but for ours specifically, because so much of it is just awful. <laughs> <laughs> to, I used to call it the purchase effect, uh, but it, I mean, it happens everywhere. It's like, you know, you go through something wretched and people that don't know or that don't understand, usually young people, they complain. And then it ends and it gets better, but they're still complaining. And then a week later, they're still complaining about it. And I've gotten to the point where, like, there isn't a transition anymore. Like, even when the rotten stuff, like, when we're right in the middle of it, you know, like, something terrible happens. I haven't even come up with a solution yet to save our butts. And I'm just grinning because I'm like, this is going to be an awesome story. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of got that ethos a little bit from our, our old plumber. He's an, an ancient guy, uh, World War II vet. And just the worse stuff got, the bigger he grinned. I mean, I'd watch him like crawl out of the mud covered in cobwebs and filth from fixing some <laughs> sewer leak under somebody's house. And, that, like, and I, he'd, I'd run into him in the hardware store in that condition. He'd just be grinning. The worse <laughs> it got, the bigger he grinned. He's like, oh, I'm going to have one to tell the grandkids tonight. <laughs> right? there's, I, there's been shows that we've done where just – Everything has gone wrong. Amps have cooked with your speakers caught on fire or something mm. like just all, just all kinds of on. stuff. You, just, you laugh like a little girl, like, wow, <laughs> that's messed up. <laughs> maybe, Can we fix that? Maybe going back, that's one of the lessons you got to figure out before you go to school or start up. Do you have the mentality to deal with stuff like that? And that was something, yeah, we were learning at the time because there's so much grousing. And you don't even know. We were grousing like it was our job in school, but by the time... And paying kids, for it. Yeah, <laughs> and paying for it. But the thing, I, I caught on to this probably earlier than I could have, but not as soon as I should have. Um, looking at the seniors, like, they had more work to do than anybody, but they were the guys always lounging around like, hey, you want a beer? Oh, no, I'm chilling out. Like, it... It wasn't that they were blowing stuff off. It was that they had gotten so good and so efficient at getting their work done that it was already done. Or they knew they had time to finish in a timely manner. So it wasn't this big scramble. And, you know, all the, you could always tell the sophomores, like, oh, God, I was in the studio for nine days. I didn't go on. Learning your pace is yeah. huge. I'm still like, here. It's been two months. What are you wanting about? Okay. <laughs> and, the, and the freshmen hear that from the sophomores. So they start like, oh, gosh. I had to write a thousand words. Oh, I had to do 15 sketches. Oh, I had to think of a thing of a thing. And meanwhile, you know, like the seniors are like, yeah, I had to design what's basically a Broadway level show with 60s era junk equipment, but it's cool. I got they that. They didn't give you me a pencil beer? sharpener. Yeah. I, was, <laughs> I just had to do it in blood. It's over now. It's like MacGyver. I had to light a show with two coconuts, a roll of duct tape, and a Swiss army knife. You want a beer? <laughs> it's cool. I got this. It's already done. I'm doing it by remote. It's... <laughs> This was before iPhones. <laughs> oh, that's what the other coconut show was for. But told you, guess, drink. Guess you didn't MacGyver enough. <laughs> I was a lightweight in college too. I couldn't drink then either. <laughs> <laughs> and well, I know you tried all. though. And I don't drink at all now, so it's a moot point. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so to, it's getting to the point where we ought to be wrapping it up because I can only fit an hour on my paltry free server space at the moment. Um. Anything? I actually kind of want to kick it over Matt's direction, just because 
these lighting guys that I went to school with are smart monkeys, and I like to get information off of them. Got any, uh, <laughs> to put you right on the spot. <laughs> Plastics. <laughs> Plastics, son. One word. Uh, what do you know? What can you tell us? Like, what's what's the exciting new stuff or... Like what's out right now or what's coming out? It doesn't have to be specific products, but like just what do you what do you see that's cool and that's new and that's coming our way? Well, I mean, certainly everything is LED and LED based now, and that's uh, I just got back from an awful show in Vegas, and that's really everything architectural, everything uh, entertainment is going that way. I mean, what the best thing is everything that was white before. White was the holy grail three years ago and they nailed that and now it's getting the right white and controlling that um, and learning the science behind it you know I mean everybody's speaking a completely different language than they spoke five years ago you were talking in watts uh, you weren't talking in output you know you just knew this wattage with this intensity in this fixture is going to give you X mm -hmm. but now you know you deal in lumens all the time it, and you're dealing in... Yeah, it's different if you're in color or in white. Or, right. And you're dealing with color rendering index, which is kind of an outdated format now, something that's based on the color you would get from an incandescent lamp. But, you know, it's almost like you're looking at... Let's say you said a cathode ray tube TV was 100% of color back in the day, and now you got an LED TV that just blows it out of the water. You know, we've got. Not, you can't measure it. With the you station. can't measure it. It's it's better in some places. It's worse in other places. And there's going to be a new format. I think it's spectrally based. You know, so you'll have different measurements within the spectrum and stuff like that. And then, uh, but that's all tightening up. Everything's getting more powerful. You know, with less power. And what's great is you know. Owners and such are really on board with buying all this, and uh, you know designers are really in the know. And they, you become a more technical person, but still maintaining a great deal of artistry as well. You're able to be artistic in ways that you couldn't be before because you could fit lights into places you could never fit them before. It's really a fantastic moving time. It's you know, I mean, may you live in interesting times, Indeed. sort of thing. And just by way of example, uh, Matt came up here to where I work, and we walked out into the sanctuary today, and he immediately, of course, started you know looking at the lighting and stuff, and you know laughing around, joking about stuff. But then we actually had kind of a serious talk for a couple of minutes. I'm actually looking at the math we did right now, which is weird. Like we sound smart sometimes, but we were literally doing math on our fingers and toes, and had our cell phones out when we were trying to calculate. We forgot how to add. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a long bit. I'm gonna do that gag sometime. Again. <laughs> Uh, kids, ask your father about the time you forgot how to add. Um, but anyway, looking at, at our sanctuary, we've got 125 recessed cans in the ceiling, some at 250, some at 500. Um, we did the math, figured out how many watts they all draw total when they're all turned on, and then I did a quick estimate as to how many hours a week they're on, looked up the price of a kilowatt hour in Buffalo, New York, and... Those 125 lights cost my employer roughly $3,000 a month, give or take, depending on how much they're turned on, probably what time of the year it is and stuff. So that's three grand just to have the house lights on. That's before I turn on a single Leco, Parkin, any kind of light on the stage. Um, looking at putting some LED fixtures in place and you know all the install costs and stuff, roughly 80000 bucks right now, which to take to the money men who right now are just buying a couple cases of tea lamps once a year getting them to bite on an $80,000 upgrade when the lights we have work fine, but then you tell them that instead of drawing, oh, what were we looking at? I didn't actually write down the amperage number, but anyway, to break it down in cost, to go from $3,000 worth of house light a month to less than $400 worth of house light a month, and the technology doesn't need really any attention for about 15 years, at which point you either decide if you're going to replace the chips or replace Just the buy a new building at that point. I Pretty mean. much. I mean, you're, hey, the cockroaches <laughs> rule the planet, and they'll be enjoying the last dying rays of those those lights. So that's the kind of excitement. I mean, we really hit a quantum. The lighting industry is kind of hitting the quantum leap that the sound industry had when line arrays popped up a little while ago, I think, and maybe even more so. Like, LEDs are so profoundly amazing in what their capabilities are, and there's so much research being poured into them right now that... And the next step is even sicker. Which they're called uh, OLEDs, organic LEDs. Yeah. Which, uh, 
a, a general LED is basically a chip with a phosphor on top of it that's uh, semi-excited, and that's how you get light out of it. It's actually made by accident. Uh, and then ever since then, it's been made purposefully, but you are still stuck in that same chip shape. Well, the organic LED is basically going to result in lighting wallpaper, in lighting ceiling material, you know? Instead of a lay-in ceiling, you'll lay in a piece of plastic. Call me when they come up with pants. Oh, I <laughs> would expect them to be first. Probably. Bono will have a pair, and then we'll... He already has a pair. Try and pick him up with well, the wheel after. With his new billion, I mean, yeah. his new Facebook billion, good on him, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, you heard it here first, kids. I hope, anyway. <laughs> no, or third or fourth, or... Right. <laughs> Enjoy. So, uh, you know, I... I touch on lighting once in a while because it's part of my responsibility here in my day job, and I did study the stuff for a bit, and I look at it quite a bit, whether I'm actually doing it or not, but uh, it's lighting is really pretty closely entwined, and actually, I should probably put a plug in here. It's worth learning some DMX kids and mm -hmm. learning how to run a board and learning a little bit of color theory, lighting theory, angles, you know, what kind of emotions you can create because... If you can go a step beyond, like, yeah, I can run your parkans for you. What do you got? Red, yellow, green, blue. Okay, done. You know, beyond doing a four-button chase at the local <laughs> rock club, you know, if you can, well, let me take all those down and we'll do some side lights and we'll make the guitar players look like they're floating like ballet dancers. Like, if you seek out that art and if you find out that you're good at it, man, just take off and run with it. Or if, you you know, if you can't totally develop the skill, at least have it, have it a little bit in your back pocket. Be able to do something make yourself a little bit more valuable, just like you should also be getting Photoshop chops as well as, even if you're going into live sound, some recording chops, because it's all coming together. And if, if you're the one-stop shop, um, I say this about my job here all the time, they really hired a technical director. <laughs> they just call me the sound guy, because um, I, yeah. I provided that. And get then, some carpentry in there, get some drafting skills. I, I built the sets, I paint. I, I do all that and I mow the lawn too. <laughs> Every, Anthony does everything but preach and drive the bus, and that's only because he doesn't have a Class B license. <laughs> we got rid of the buses too. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I would probably be driving one. Probably would. So next is the Divinity degree. Myself, I, I draw actually the... online. There's I can't remember what the church is. The Universal Life Church. I'm an ordained minister. I would love. Oh, it. so there you go. You I would love it. If somebody would, would confer. A, not, well, I don't want to be. A, I wouldn't want to make a mockery of pastorship. But if anybody in a university is able to do this someday, I would love to have an honorary doctorate to hang on my wall. And you better believe I would put that on my business cards, <laughs> Doctor John Deaton. We, we got to know somebody. BS. <laughs> I thought you had a BFA. No, it's BS. Beauty. <laughs> and we ran out of steam. So that's the show, kids. Let me just punch the button here and see how we're doing for time. Oh, splendid. We're actually going to finish up a touch early for once, so that's cool. Uh, just in case you didn't want to listen to a whole hour of audio babble thrown in with some lighting babble this week, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, hopefully for next week, kids, which this is actually going to air, what, the week after Labor Day? So Memorial Day, Labor Day is in the fall. Memorial Day. There we go. Tour time. I don't even know what year it is. I didn't know that it was Saturday. <laughs> I, I haven't known what day it was for the last week. I've known what day it is since I started working. working here. And that's how you know you're in the business. <laughs> exactly. It's tour time. I wrote an article about it. Look it up. Uh, so this this podcast should go to air first weekend in June, so hopefully second weekend in June. Um, I'm happy get, Flag Day. Happy Flag Day. I'll get uh, my old friend Lucy De Jesus. Who actually, her, her last name's different now. So anyway, my good friend Lucy from Purchase. Um, to come on and talk some more about, instead of musicality and mixing, we're going to talk about mixing and technology and musicality and whatever else she wants to talk about, because she's awesome and has an interesting life, and you will dig it. And following that, gosh, I'm thinking a long way in the future now. Maybe we'll Hopefully, get that Behringer. I want to get the panel back together so we can tear this whole Behringer thing apart, mostly because I like watching Carl and Gordon turn red. <laughs> <laughs> For a bunch uh, of guys that aren't Irish, you wouldn't know. It is interesting. It's if you're out in the forums, it's uh, that Behringer thing is really stirring up a lot of ire and furor and other vocabulary words that <laughs> I won't belabor you with. Uh, so, all right, we're going to wrap it up here before I babble on any longer. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, especially our European listeners. Good and talk to our friends in Germany. Good day to our friends down under. We have a few listeners, a few Kiwis, I understand. Really? If if the Google analytics are to believe, there are some uh, New Zealanders who 
take a listen. So we're happy to have you all on, as well as all our northern, eastern, western, southern, and central European friends. I don't truly believe that we're getting any hits from Russia. I think those are just porn botnets. I, I'm convinced that no, not an actual soul in, in Russia that's living and breathing listens to us. Porn bots need love, too. Or sound <laughs> advice, I guess. Sure. <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to compress that and still give you the feel like you're in the room with them. Stop. This is a family show. It was a family <laughs> show. <laughs> Don't let the kid... All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll go back in and I'll edit in a... We do this late at night. Do you know what's on TV right now? This is true. Whatever. Okay. okay. NYPD Blue, what kind of awful things they'd play after 10 o'clock at night? <laughs> said the S word on TV once. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see that episode. I remember hearing about it. I did. Guy. It didn't exactly change the world. I, I was eight. Yeah. There's a there's a there's a butt. Pretty sure there's a butt. And on another one too. See. Yeah, <laughs> I did see that one. Ugh. Remember how angry my parents were. That's a there's, weak I There's an ass. <laughs> it's right on the TV. My dad was like, "Oh, it's a nice ass." <laughs> Wasn't it a dude though? I don't know. No, it was a dude. It was, was it a dude? It was no, Dennis I thought friends. it was, like, <laughs> it was, it was a, a messed chick. up butt. Maybe it was you know, no. a different show. Maybe it wasn't yeah. NYPD Blue. Ginger Keister. I don't know. Why are we talking about this, and why is the tape still Because early? it's time to go. It is. Pretty much is. All right, so we're wrapping it up. Thanks for listening to the Smart to Noise Ratio Pro Audio Podcast. I'm your host, John Dayton, thanking you yet again. To my left, Anthony Kuzabucky. Good night. To my right, Matt Dacey. See ya. Thanks for coming, guys. We'll see you next week. That's a wrap.